Okay. So, right, in translation, it's a sequence of bases in the mRNA. That piece that we saw was an mRNA where we, where it controls the sequence of amino acids. Okay. And we control the sequence of amino acids based on that ribosome and then complementary base pairing between the mRNA and a tRNA that's carrying the amino acids. Okay, so we're going to walk through that stuff in just a second. Ribosomes are the catalytic entity. A ribosome is, is ribosomal RNA and proteins, this big complex. Okay. The ribosomal RNA is catalytic. The actual RNA has enzymatic activity in that ribosome. It was always previously thought that because it's RNA and protein, that it was the protein that had the enzymatic activity. And as it turns out, the RNA also has enzymatic catalytic activity as well. So both proteins and the RNA molecule itself that makes up the ribosome acts like enzymes, has catalytic activity. So if we call something an enzyme, we mean it's made of protein. If it's a RNA that has catalytic activity, we call it a ribozyme. Okay, so that would be the dis difference. An RNA that acts like an enzyme is a ribozyme. Okay? And so ribosomes can have catalytic activity in the protein of them and also in their RNA sequence. So this is just sort of the overall that we were talking about last time. And this would be specific to transcription and translation in prokaryotes. Right? Remember the questions, question was, there's no nucleus standing between transcription and translation in a prokaryote. There's no RNA processing. As soon as you shoot that RNA off during transcription, a ribosome can hop on it and do translation. So it can be co-transcription and translation at the same time. And if we're talking about here's the, the start of a gene, right, that would be the promoter region. So that's where the, the minus 10 and minus 35 would be. A polymerase can jump on it, start doing transcription, right? The first one would have been this guy over here, right? It's now transcribed that big, long mRNA, right? It started there, and it cruised all the way to here. Well, it, we don't have to wait for that RNA to leave before ribosomes hop on it. Ribosome can hop on it as soon as any of it's out. And in reality, this one would actually, which this picture could be better, has lots of ribosomes on it. Because as soon as the ribosome moves out of that 5' prime end, another ribosome can jump on. So really, there can be lots of polymerase molecules, all the fat green guy, and then lots of meatballs, lots of ribos ribosomes on each of those RNAs. Okay? And so as soon as that guy was out of the way, that guy hopped on and started going. As soon as that guy was out of the way of the promoter, that guy hopped on, and so on and so forth. Okay? And then... This, that piece of RNA should have five or six ribosomes on it also. As soon as the ribosome moves out of that start area, another one can hop on. Okay. So we can do lots of transcription, essentially. And it's not simultaneous. They're a little behind each other, but they don't wait till one polymerase gets all the way across and falls off. Okay. They can just hop on as soon as they can. Same with ribosomes. They don't have to wait till they get all the way done and fall off before another one starts. If it's a prokaryote, there's no nucleus, right? Yeah, so this is specifically for prokaryotes, okay, not for eukaryotes. Okay. The same idea of multiple polymerases hopping on a gene is true for eukaryotes, but no ribosome can hop on because it's in the nucleus, exactly, right? And ribosomes are only in the cytoplasm, either free, floating around, floating, or attached to the ER. Okay, so we can't do co-transcription and translation in eukaryotes. We can do polypolymerase activity and get a whole bunch of strands of RNA off essentially at the same time. And then once we process the RNA and send it to the cytoplasm, we can have a meatball jump on and go, another meatball, polyribosomes on each mRNA. But we can't do it at the same time, like in prokaryotes. Right? And remember, transcription always travels in the 3' prime direction, can only add the 3' prime ends, uses that 3' prime OH to add the next nucleotide. The ribosome reads the mRNA from the 5' prime end to the 3' prime end. Okay, so you can think of it sort of marching down codon by codon, triplet by triplet, 
all the way down, starting at the five prime end, and then falling off at the three prime end. Yes, ma'am. So this is, yeah, so that's a good question. This is just one gene, okay? It's just being transcribed in five, yeah, so, that, so each one of those yellow strands is the exact same sequence. It's the same template strand you're complementary base pairing. It's just we don't have to spend the time waiting for that guy to get done before the next guy hops on. Okay, so it's like an orgy. Okay? You don't have to wait your turn. You just hop on as soon as you can. <laughs> oh, my God, people. What the hell is wrong with that woman? <laughs> In eukaryotes, we can't do that, right? Because we have that compartmentalization crap and we have to process the RNA, right? So we can't, as, as it's coming off of transcription, that's not mRNA. That's our pre-mRNA or our primary transcript. We have, what do we have to do? We have to do three things to it before we send it to the cytoplasm. Cap, upside down G, that's methylated. The poly A tail. And then splicing, right? Splicing right after the cap and maybe finishing after the tail. Okay. Then it's ready. It's a full mRNA. Shoot it out, right, through the nuclear pore. Then a meatball can hop on it. And then lots of meatballs hop on it, right? So this stupid little star would be the five prime cap. You know, we'd. It actually, the small subunit in eukaryotes actually grabs the cap, slides to the first AUG. We start translation. As soon as that guy's maybe here, another meatball's going to grab it, right? Another ribosome, another, right? It's going to go all the way through, making its, or this is the protein, sorry, go all the way through till it falls off. But there's a line up behind it. You don't have to wait your turn on that either. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So her deal... The question was, if every mRNA has to have an AUG, right? That's how I said you can find the non-template strand, blah, 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 to do transcription, because every mRNA has to have an AUG to start translation. The first amino acid that comes off of translation is always methionine. Okay? So when a protein is first made, the first amino acid of every single protein is methionine in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes. The exception to that, if you went and took a cell and just got all the proteins out and then we send them out for sequencing, right, you're going to say, ha ha, this one didn't start with methionine. In your face, Malone. You're a liar. <laughs> right? You can have processing happen to proteins later. You may clip off the first few amino acids to make a functional protein. Right? So if you actually looked at them in the cell, they don't all have methionine. Most of them do. Not everyone has the very first. But it did when it was first born. When it was first translated, they all start with methionine. Exactly. And another common misconception is that you can have AUG, you can have methionines everywhere else in the protein too. Right? You can have an AUG here and then a whole bunch of other crap and then another AUG, that would be methionine. You can have a whole shitload of methionines in proteins, but you have to have one at the beginning, okay? Does that make sense? You can have one at the end, right? Right before the stop codon, you could, that could be your first and your last. It could be, well, it can't be all of them. I'm pretty sure there isn't a protein that has all methionine. But, right, it's not just to start. They can exist elsewhere also. 